see. How's that look to y'all? All right, wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. It's my pleasure to present to you um, about Green Hospitals. I'm going to share a little bit about the work that I've done, um, but I'm really curious to um, hear where you're all from, um, what kind of nursing you do. So if you could please drop that in the chat, I'd be very curious to, to learn about that. Um, I want to start off with um, um, a passage, um, and this is my why. I had managed to eke out another few months on my latest clinical trial, despite tiny bits of growth this spring and summer. The verdict is in for my latest scan. Too much growth to keep going on the current chemo, so time to change it up. I'll be forever grateful for the 16 month of relative health that I, this clinical trial gave me. The fact that I had managed to recover from liver failure, enjoy life despite the pandemic will always amaze me. I'm sad and a little scared about changing treatment, but in the words of Mary Oliver, keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable. I'm still waiting for a decision about what medication I will begin. So that translates into some extra time without chemo in my system. Usually by the time I'm feeling better, after my week off, it's time for my next appointment. I've been cooking more, going to Pilates and taking long walks in the park. Life is so much easier when I, to enjoy when I feel healthy. Although my skin was disappointing, it's not unexpected. I can usually tell when there's some growth and I've been having frequent nausea. My enlarged liver starts to push on my stomach and a heavy, dense feeling in my liver with some dense tenderness. I remember starting nursing school in the 1990s and thinking I would never get treatment for stage four cancer. The roller coaster of emotions and constant physical issues with no cure. I thought that I would never put my body and my family through all of that. Ha, the wisdom of youth. Turns out there's a lot that I will put myself through and smile while I'm doing it to be here with all of you. Julie Morgan, wife, mother, daughter, sister, aunt, and friend has touched the lives of so many people in her community. Considered the link and connector within her family and friends, she was passionate about nature and environmental health. Julie graduated from Case Western Reserve as a nurse, worked as a registered nurse at the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio State University and the University of California, San Francisco for 15 years. She was diagnosed with hormone positive invasive ductal breast cancer on October 10, 2011. She marked her, her year anniversary post mastectomy by joining the board of directors of the nonprofit Breast Cancer Action. Almost five years to the day, she was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. She lived every day channeling her passion and energy for life and shared this with her daughter and husband, who were all things her center. Through travel, environmental health, and activism, friendship, family, and community, Julie truly lived. She died on November 29th, 2021, surrounded by her family. And she was there for all of us, always giving 100%. She was that rare mix of human being that brought compassion, kindness, patience, and love to everything she touched. She built community wherever she was, whether on a trip to an adventurous destination, in a crowd of a concert, or simply helping out on a number of other things she did in the world. She was always building community. Smiling through treatment and probably wearing a costume, working the room at a breast cancer action fundraiser or explaining what was happening with her last scan, Julia was able to care for others even in the midst of her illness. While she was never one to sugarcoat the facts, in her words, when I last went to my Bay Area Young Survivors group um, and met in the city in 2017, we were joined by Janet, Lori, Kate, and Harani. They have all died in the years since that we were together in that beautiful place, leaving behind so many that cared for them. Do not believe we are making amazing headway in breast cancer world. Yes, there have been breakthroughs and scientists are working hard for us, but there have been um, there have been uh, less than 10% of breast cancer research dollars spent that go to metastatic disease, stage four, the kind that kills. We won't get anywhere fast. This is the community that Julie built, will have a long lasting impact on the world and her most fervent wish to hear it in her own words, a letter to, that was written to her daughter that she shared with us. You have my eyes, anyone can see that. It terrifies me when I think that you might have my breast cancer risk too. I don't and won't live in constant state of active fear for you, your health, your planet, but I worry on the regular. I get reminded of the chemical soup into which you were born, the toxins that course through my body and into yours and now into the air we breathe, the food that you eat, the toys that you play with. And I think, what have I done? What have we all done? Babies' little bodies polluted before they can take their first breath. I did not need to become a mother to make me an environmentalist, 
a safe chemical advocate or an activist. But knowing that I'm responsible for your little body, body entering this world does certainly amp up my sense of urgency. Uh, so there's a couple pictures of Julie. And when she did her CAT scans, always dressed in a con costume. And that's her daughter, Danica. And so now that you've heard my why, um, I just want to thank you all for being here and um, paying attention to this very important issue. Some objectives um, that we always want to include when we're talking about uh, presentations. Um, and I have one other quote I wanted to share too uh, from Maya Angelou. As a nurse, we have the opportunity to heal the heart, mind, body, soul of our patients, their families, and ourselves. They may forget your name, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. So I want to give you an overview today of uh, some different uh, topics uh, in terms of greening hospitals. Um, and this is by no means an ex uh, extensive list, but some of the things that I've been working on, and I hope that you'll consider joining, uh, working on us, uh, joining with us to work on these issues as well in the future. Um, so we're gonna talk about green teams, pharmaceutical waste, chemical exposures in terms of masks and pill crushing, some of the biomonitoring research, um, and then future work. And I'm very curious to hear about what you're most interested in learning about. So green teams. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do green teams. And um, this is one of the ways that I um, first really got to know Julie, the um, my friend uh, and fellow nurse that lost her life to breast cancer, um, was to work through um, hospital green team at UCSF. Um, I just wanted to share this, um, that I think that some of the ways that I really got into this work was to work with the green team and understand how that's going on within the hospital. Um, and there are our department and unit-based green teams, like say you, you work on a certain unit and you all just get together and talk about things that you can do. Um, multidisciplinary or grassroots efforts, and that's the, the team that I worked mostly on um, a while ago, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Focus work groups that are working on particular issues such as medical waste or a particular issue. Um, executive leadership from the hospital system, um, which has been integral to making real big changes and including purchasing um, health systems in multiple hospitals. Um, and where, for, where I work at the University of California, San Francisco, the, there is the UC Office of the President on Sustainable Practices and they um, have a really big overreach and I maybe wouldn't classify them as a green team per se, but it is, um, uh, very useful to know that there are really big hospital systems um, out there doing this work. Um, I also included, and these slides will be available to you after the presentation, but um, within these, there'll be two links um, to talk about the UC Office of uh, the President's Sustainable Practices Policy, and it's very comprehensive, as well as a practice green health um, comparison chart for some of the different ways that green teams work. And I am not paying attention to questions in the chat. So Greg, if there are questions, um, I know maybe we can hold them, I guess, till the end, but um, Greg's gonna monitor those questions for me. So this was a picture of our green team many years ago. Um, and we worked with a variety of different people. So we had unit secretaries and uh, nurses aides, we call them patient care um, uh, assistants where I work, uh, nurses, managers, and uh, there's another picture of Julie. Um, and we created the UCSF Green Group and we met uh, once a month and we had different talks. Um, we had often show a short 10 minute video um, and then have people talk about what they were doing in their areas and things like that. We also partnered with um, different outside organizations um, to uh, get interest. Uh, and this was a an example of when we were giving out um, CFL light bulbs, the compact fluorescent light bulbs back in the day between when we transitioned from incandescence to um, LEDs mostly. And uh, we gave, a, uh, gave out uh, CFL light bulbs to a lot of the staff um, in the cafeteria. Um, another thing that we did is we took a trip to Recology in San Francisco um, where you can see um, all the waste being processed. And this is really eye-opening and I highly encourage anybody to take out, take field trips. Um, so you can go to the transfer center and see how the recycling is actually done. 
Um, you can visit the uh, wastewater processing unit. It's really smelly there, but um, it's also very interesting uh, to give you um, a bigger understanding of how things are done. One of the other uh, things that we did with the green group are the green team at my hospital is um, in uh, 2008. Um, there was another um, organization and it was sort of fo called Focus the Nation. And the, um, the focus was to have these showings about um, climate change and global warming um, and hold a lecture and discussion afterwards. And so we held- They said that he, that's not enough. We held these uh, talks and then had people come together and discuss it. Um, positions for social responsibility was there. Um, and then we met afterwards to have really great discussions. Um, and this sort of prompted there to be um, a higher level of interest uh, where I was working in, uh, working on issues for um, climate change within the hospital system. And that's just one way to do green teams. Um, but there are so many other ways to do green teams. And one of the things that you can do is you can just really reach out to your colleagues um, or in your own department to see who's interested um, in working on things. Um, if you already have a passion for this, you might know who also has a passion for it in your, in your department. Um, and really you can start small by, you know, just make turning off lights, uh, getting other people to turn off things that are not in use or um, using reusable um, uh, food supplies, uh, utensils, and things like that within your unit instead of using disposable. Um, and then build that up, find out who's doing what and um, uh, start increasing it. I think one of the best tips that um, probably uh, Dr. Barb Sattler gave to me was to um, always be curious and to have an ask. Um, and what I mean by that is you know, don't just assume that the way that something's being done is the right way that it's being done or the best way that it's being done. And I think as nurses, we can all understand that importance of being curious and really asking why and getting to the heart of it and talking to our patients about understanding um, their, their own health practices and therefore also understanding our own um, culture and the way that we're doing things uh, within the health healthcare systems. And then when you go to someone um, or have a meeting with someone, it's always good to have an ask or a question so that you can continue that conversation and that dialogue between you two. Um, and so you can keep that going. Um, other ways to do um, green teams. Um, these are some simple ideas. And a lot of us have already been doing some of these things like eliminating plastic water bottles from your workplace. But it may be easier said than done to get a policy um, initiated on that type of thing where you no longer supply your workplace with plastic bottles, um, uh, as well as plastic cutlery. Um, I know that in our uh, uh, cafeteria, the, there is a dispenser. So you actually have to push a button to grab a fork or a knife um, that's plastic cutlery so that it discourages people from grabbing a whole bunch of them um, and they actually have to get just one at a time. Um, you can give a presentation for uh, your own staff meeting about something that you learned today. And we have lots of materials on our website. I know uh, Greg put the link in the chat. Um, you can even just share some of those things. There's lots of great um, resources out there for getting people to think about what they're doing. I remember when I started on this uh, journey, um, the story of stuff was such a inspirational um, uh, short film uh, document about why do we have so many things and what's planned obsolescence. So my um, ask for you all today is for you to figure out what planned obsolescence is. Um, I want you to do a little uh, research into that and I think you'll figure out what it is and be very frustrated with um, with uh, the consumer world of why things um, have a planned obsolescence. Um, and then also work on preventing wasteful practices. One of the things that a lot of nurses come to, um, to find, you know, green hospitals on is that we just do such wasteful things in patient rooms. Um, you bring something into the room uh, and then it's considered dirty and we can't use it again, even if it's never touched the patient. Um, and so how do we decrease supplies? How do we um, change these um, wasteful practices that uh, um, that we're currently doing? We don't even think about. 
um, where I work, I work in kidney transplant and, um, I had never even thought of, I've been in that role for almost 10 years and I had never even thought about, uh, this very small issue, but it's, uh, something that, um, just wanted to t share this story about because I think it's it's so interesting how we can get very uh, siloed or narrow down and we we even forget what we're doing. But um, for example, patients will come in for kidney transplants and they can be on peritoneal dialysis. And so when we have an order set uh, through our medical uh, electronic medical record, it will automatically order um, some gentamicin cream to go around the outside of their peritoneal dialysis catheter. And that catheter uh, is about to be um, removed and they're gonna get kidney transplant and she'll never need, hopefully need that dialysis again. But the pharmacy then has to process the order for the gentamicin cream and then dispense it. And then sometimes it gets used once um, and then it's removed. But it's, it's just an example of how something that we do, it takes a lot of labor, effort, time, money, and is really just a waste in the end. So I encourage you to all think about what those types of wasteful things are within your practices as well. Um, some other green ideas is food. Um, can really get involved with a lot of um, food ideas. I know that there's been nurses who've started farmer's markets outside their, their hospitals um, one day a week or even one day a month. Um, there's also been people who've done uh, patient gardens um, and done rooftop gardens where patients can go and visit and um, uh, visit those gardens, either veggie gardens or just flower gardens. It's uh, very therapeutic. Um, other places have done meatless Mondays or default veggie food options where um, the what they mean by that is that um, there's not a meat a uh, forward meal, or if you do catering for wherever you were working, you can have mostly vegetarian options and you'd have to opt in to a meat option. I think we all um, can do better about eating less meat. Um, some other things you can do is work on waste, um, break room recycling, depending on where you uh, work and what your um, capabilities are to recycle. Um, I've taken a couple of trips to the Midwest and the South, and I just keep still being shocked by the fact that uh, a lot of places are still not recycling aluminum cans and it breaks my heart every single time. So I realized that um, recycling can be limited by what's available in your area. Um, uh, patient room recycling, one of the projects I had worked on earlier was to help be uh, help initiate a recycling system within the hospital for um, durable plastic uh, to be recycled. Um, where I am in San Francisco, where college was very interested in recycling um, plastics, and um, we were able to recycle those those patient basins and some other items. Um, now, recycling is always is not always the best choice because it doesn't um, get made back into um, a similar product. Um, reducing waste is always better than recycling, um, but that is one other option. Um, medication waste. Uh, is a big thing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Um, chemicals, we often use triclosan and soaps and different other uh, products, cleaning supplies. We can always use uh, more environmentally cleaning supplies. And again, this requires a lot of collaboration with different um, teammates on your um, on your uh, green team, but it's uh, a wonderful thing to, to look into doing. Um, one of the things that uh, California Nurses for Environmental Health and Justice is interested in doing is um, helping nurses like yourselves um, use a environmental health assessment tool to really understand what's going on uh, in your hospital or unit or clinic to understand um, how green is your your workplace and um, and can it can it be can it be cleaner greener um, so this is a, an old uh, self assessment tool. Um, where you can sort of understand if you have uh, hazard communication policies and are you still using any mercury around it? Hopefully not. Um, do you use um, any uh, DEHP containing IV bags and tubings? What pesticides are being used? Um, and, and beyond. Uh, we've started to work on a more in-depth one and I'm gonna show you that. Um, and this is, we would love to develop this more for nurses and really make it be a living document so that you can see links to um, uh, other uh, nonprofits or other organizations that are doing great work and um, 
really have this be uh, a shareable resource for nurses who are interested in assessing their um, uh, their their hospital or their unit or their clinic. Um, so I'm going to plug for you to all join the Greening Hospitals um, uh, work group, uh, and we'll tell you more about how to do that uh, within the chat and at the end of this. Um, and again, and growing your green team really involves a lot of different uh, leaders or people from different uh, departments um, to work on more complex ideas. Um, so you can consider involving uh, uh, anesthesia and facilities, hospitality, IT, your nursing leadership, uh, nutrition services, material services, pharmacy, purchasing, physicians. There's so many uh, folks that need to get involved when you work on different um, uh, areas and different things. So make sure you branch out as well. So I wanted to just share um, some of the work I'm currently doing with a wonderful team that's led by Esther Rav um, Ipka, who's at the UC, who's at UCSF, and she is the um, diabetes educator. Um, and then Keith and uh, So from Pharmacy has also been heavily involved, as well as Kai Wang, who's a sustainability analyst. Um, this project is sort of an example of a focus green team that's really looking at multi-dose medications and how um, they can be really wasteful. Um, and this arose out of looking at medication, specifically insulin pens, um, the, the waste uh, that goes along with them. So um, we typically use two different types of insulin um, for, for most of our patients at, at UCSF, which would be Lantus, the long acting or aspirate, the short acting insulins, and they come in pen form. We obviously also have, you know, NPH and regular insulin, and those comes in, in vials, uh, which is also uh, multi-dose. But um, for this purposes of this, we're gonna talk about the pens. Um, and what we were noticing was that um, pens, uh, there are a lot of duplicate pens. So pens were getting lost and uh, uh, between patients being transferred and uh, ended up with, patients ended up with more than one pen uh, during their hospitalization. And so this um, issue is brought to light and we've got all these wonderful uh, folks on board to start looking at this issue of um, multi-dose medication um, waste. Um, and so in addition to pharmacists, um, the nurses, uh, sustainability analysts, we have an anesthesiologist who's the director of uh, sustainability, Dr. Seema Gandhi. I also have um, Dr. Rushkoff, who is um, uh, an endocrinologist and heavily involved with uh, diabetes management. Um, and then we also involved some respiratory care service specialists uh, to look at inhaler waste, um, because that is also a similar issue. So um, we are considering, you know, the entire environment, um, entire life cycle of these medications um, and doing a life cycle analysis of, you know, what it costs to make an insulin pen from basically from start to finish from cradle to grave um, is something that we will look forward to doing more in the future. Um, and then also understanding what does that wasted insulin look like in the environment to animals and people. Um, and really, you know, that's the deeper dive that we have yet to do for this, um, this work. Um, but we also understand that there's a big financial cost uh, to the patients um, by in completely using or getting duplicate um, multi use medication, um, having multi uh, dose medication waste, um, but then the hospital is also paying for the, the waste uh, of that medication through incinerating it. And as some of you know, that um, insulin needs to be um, put in the black bin and that needs to be incinerated. So um, and that incineration then goes back into you know, our air. So um, that can be very wasteful. Um, other non-insulin, but kind of along the same lines, waste is any test strips or lancets, anything that's left in the bedside um, that has to be sort of discarded once um, the, it reaches the patient's room and then is considered dirty. Um, so what we were interested in looking at is seeing that these patients end up with multiple um, insulin pens and the, you know, the same medication. And we saw that when they're transferred from the emergency room or from different units to other units or um, the recovery room or to the ICU, um, that patients would get uh, dispensed another um, insulin pen often because it was lost during transportation 
or um, the nurses put it in their pocket and accidentally took it home, um, or if there was some other uh, electronic medical record uh, issue that was causing the pharmacy to dispense another pen when one was not needed. And this might not be the most updated um, data, but um, we, the, this work group counted actually how many insulin pens and how many inhalers were duplicative. Now I'm just talking about the, for this purposes of this slide, the, the duplicative um, medications uh, as opposed to um, uh, underused uh, insulin pens or um, inhalers, for example, if only two units were used out of a, a 60 unit pen. So that's not really including that information here, but that is some of the future work we uh, look forward to doing. So um, we looked at how much um, the cost of an insulin aspart pen was. So unit you know, cost was $70 for one of those, those pens and $94 for the, in the Glargine pens. And they counted how many patients, how many um, times that the patient received a second pen when uh, they hadn't used all of the units from that pen and counted up you know how many of there were and then we realized that it was you know about a half a million dollars in um wasted um pens now that doesn't even include the incineration cost um at, or any of that as well and then they did that similarly for inhaler types um which uh the unit cost for some of these inhalers is also quite expensive and that worked out to be almost eighty thousand dollars and again, that doesn't include the costs on the environment to, you know, incinerating or wasting um, these aerosolized medications and things like that. So this is quite a big, big uh, issue um, and not an easy to solve type of problem. However, it's um, definitely worth working on. Um, so some of the things that we've been doing to work on this multi-dose medication waste issue is to uh, really understand the problem uh, first. Um, so uh, interviewing nurses and asking what was going on, um, why was this happening, talking to the pharmacist and understanding what was going on within um, pharmacy. And we realized that sometimes um, a second pen would be issued if the dose was changed um, uh, or it would get lost in transport. There were some misconceptions around how the medication should be transported between units. Um, and things like that. Um, additionally, they plan to educate some the staff by doing um, a module and doing staff meetings. And they've changed um, uh, the checklist between transfers for patients um, and to include this special med bag in the transport request so that all the medications that were allocated to that patient while they're on that unit prior to transfer would be sent to the next unit with them. Um, we'll be looking into EPIC, which is our electronic medical record, to um, understand more about the transfers, the checklists, um, how medications are uh, dispensed as well. And then we've applied for a grant, um, which is really interested. At, UC at UCSF, there's a um, grant called Caring Wisely, and that looks to um, improve um, uh, processes, reduce waste, um, and uh, that is something that we hope will be able to fund the next levels of this uh, focus green team effort on multi-dose medication waste. This is an example of um, the patient transport, you know, checklist uh, and a and a um, advisory that a pop up that comes up to let nurses know that we need to check for an existing pen so, without pulling a second pen. Um, pharmaceutical waste. Uh, this is another really important area um, that. Uh, I've worked on it was a, as a grad student, and then I'm really interested in uh, looking at this um, with respect to the insulin pens, but also just kind of what goes on in real life on the units. Um, and there's so there's so much so much med medication waste, uh, as you all know, if you're working in healthcare, just realize you know what we're throwing out and um, how it's how is it getting back into the water system? How's it getting back into the earth? Um, and I'm not going to talk about all of these, um, but I just wanted to highlight this because um, this is what I focused on in, in graduate school. But uh, manufacturing process, I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, Bioexcretion, um, 
as you know, if you're taking medications, uh, any uh, unmetabolized medications may be excreted uh, through urination or um, or through feces, and then that is then processed in wastewater treatment facilities, which are not handled to uh, remove medications from the water system. Um, disposing uh, medications in water, flushing them down the sink, uh, wasting them, um, or creams and ointments being washed off uh, of your body, and then again down, you know, into the the water system. Um, I know that the FDA was recently had a proposal or request out for information um, about different uh, disposal medication systems, collection systems, and processing of that. And they were requesting um, uh, different systems like a collection bin and um, uh, the companies that will then process those as well. So I'll have to find out to be continued on what is actually uh, the most updated information on that. Um, but as you all know, that medications do end up uh, down the sink. Um, if you have medications you don't want anymore and you throw them out in the trash, which you're not supposed to do, they can go in the landfill and then leach back out in there as well. Um, and there's also hazardous medications that are uh, incinerated for different regulations. Um, and then the ash of medications went, that are incinerated and they go back into the air, water, et cetera. Um, Medications are also applied to um, the land uh, treatment plant, wastewater sludge, and then animal use, bioexcretion by the animals. If you're treating your cows and pigs and uh, livestock with um, different antibiotics, um, going their bioexcretion, and then also if you're ingesting any of those meat or animal products that have received those medications. Um, this safe disposal medications is really important because as we said, wastewater treatment facilities are not capable of filtering those medications out. And the truth is, is we really don't know what the health impacts from unintentional exposures to medications are. Um, we do know that sometimes um, exposures to different medications um, can be endocrine disruptors at really low levels and they can be more harmful at low levels. Um, they can definitely be harmful to ecosystems and cause antibiotic resistance. And that is something that um, I struggle with, with my patient population and kidney transplant. A lot of my patients are immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, and they end up with um, antibiotic um, resistant infections, urinary tract infections frequently, which land them in the hospital and require getting uh, pick or midlines and getting IV antibiotics for weeks to months sometimes. Um, and it's a, it really impacts their health. Also, uh, safe disposal of medication is to important to keep controlled substances out of the hands of people who are uh, they weren't intended for. Um, I'm not going to get into this slide just for timing wise, but um, there's a lot of research uh, looking at pharmaceuticals and water, and basically it's ubiquitous that um, most water has pharmaceuticals, um, hormones, um, lots of different things in it. That's you know big soup. Um, going back to the the passage that I read from my friend, Julie, it's just, what are we doing to ourselves? Um, our most uh, sensitive populations, our youngest, our oldest, and our immunocompromised and ill folks, um, what, what are we doing? Um, presentation wouldn't be complete without a, a, a cartoon slide. The Viagra in the water makes me want to swim upstream, but the Prozac is making me too tired. So, um, I think this is a really important issue, and if anyone's interested in doing more, more work around this, um, I'd love to collaborate with you. Um, this is an example of some of the um, unwanted medications and their health effects. So endocrine disruptors like est estradiols, testosterone, progesterone can reduce sperm count, um, uh, decrease fertility, and, and be hormonally triggering. Um, Neurotoxins, lindane um, is now banned in California, but that's a treatment for licensed scabies and it's a neurotoxin. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's many uh, chemotherapies that are used to treat cancers, but are also carcinogenic themselves. Um, if you're taking care of some of those patients, you know that you have to gown up and protect yourself um, to dispose of um, bioexcreted, uh, you know, urine or um, any other handlings of those patients. Um, uh, but again, this is not being able to be treated efficiently in wastewater uh, systems um, when it gets to the, you know, the plants. Um, there's other medications that cause birth defects. Uh, we see that too. Um, Low-level androgens can cause hypospadias where the um, 
the meatus or the um, the uh, ureter, the tip of is not on the end of the penis. It's not lower on the penis. Um, and this is something sometimes I see in our patients um, and having that disrupted um, general urinal tract can cause kidney problems as well. Um, I am taking, I'm going to come go through a couple of these a little bit faster just so we can get through the whole presentation. But um, there's a lot of people that work within the pharmaceutical waste management system and all these folks um, help regulate medications and it's a challenge to make any progress and make changes on some of these things uh, because so many people are involved and there's so many uh, rules and regulations around this. Um, and here's another slide for your reference about uh, the relationships between all of these organizations that manage medications and how we produce basically safe standards around some of these things. Um, you might be familiar with your hazardous um, waste uh, waste medications and this um, is how we basically treat the waste of medications and where they go afterwards, which bin they go into. Um, also the safe occupational hazards for which uh, PPE that you need to wear when you're handling some of them. It's very complicated. Um, and this is a slide just showing that there are some, uh, the EPA and NIOSH have different listed um, types of medications in terms of their characteristics, uh, if they are toxic or, um, or else how they should be handled in terms of uh, transported. But there's some hazardous drugs that are also um, hazardous waste. And that means that there has to be a way to handle them safely for you uh, nurses and everyone who's managing them. Um, at UCSF, we have this hazardous uh, drug list, uh, which uh, determines what PPE you need to wear and then also how you need to dispose of it. Um, and this is just a slide that shows kind of those different classifications here um, and how it's handled, but then also um, uh, where it will be eventually disposed of and, and the risks associated with it. Um, and so uh, not NIOSH is, you know, proposed to produce this 2020 And so where I work has created their own categories to see how it should be managed. This is just an example of um, some of the ways that we have to dispose medications and why this is an issue. And then this is, you know, an updated one and uh, it's complicated. So it's nurses need to keep on their toes about what um, and their understanding of these medications are. Um, and again, this is that was all downstream stuff, kind of like what do we do with it afterwards, but really importantly that we look upstream. Um, the upstream framework is to provide a guide for nursing actions to promote health by reduction of environmental risks to citizens. Uh, it's Butterfield. And so uh, I'm really interested in looking at these upstream actions um, to have um, a better impact. So we can, if any of you are nurse practitioners or uh, prescribers, we can prevent unwanted medications from accumulating by working on furnishing practices or just um, prescribing practices so that we can decrease the amount of unwanted medications in the first place. Um, be really interested to see if an, an insurance companies would be interested in the future about doing trial medications before filling a larger dis, um, supply. You know, that's a, a big challenge. And again, lots of folks involved with that. We could also consider policies to help reduce medication waste um, uh, and the ability for hospitals to dispense these multi-dose medications on discharge, like these insulin pens um, or inhalers, patients could take them home with them, but there are current uh, restrictions about how um, each hospital system can dispense medications. And then some folks have done some medication donation in the past around HIV medication recycling program. I'm not sure if this is still active or not, but it, um, it, it's really interesting to look into some of that stuff. Chemical exposures. Um, just going to briefly talk about some of the work that the California Nurses for Environmental Health and Justice have been doing around these chemical exposures on pill crushing and masks. And um, just briefly, nurses are inadvertently inhaling medications when they're crushing medications. When you take a med, you're giving it to a patient who can't swallow well, you're crushing it, putting it into powder form, and then adding it to applesauce or something else that they can more swallow. And that aerosolized um, fine powder can be toxic, even if it's a really innocuous medication like Tylenol. Um, but we are also crushing other medications that can be carcinogenic, teratogenic, 
have a developmental toxicity, organ toxicity, um, or have a genotoxicity. And it's not something that we've routinely been looking at this issue um, of this particulate matter that's in the air. Um, so Dr. Amiri, uh, who's worked with this uh, group as well, has been looking at that. And she recently published an article um, about this. Um, and she stated, crushing pills can disperse the particulate matter into indoor air. The particulate matter is a widespread air pollutant composed of microscopic particles and droplets of various sizes and may, um, and may carry active or inactive ingredients that nurses can inhale. So another thing to consider when you're crushing medications. Um, and I don't have a great answer about what to do about it. There are some different delivery systems that can be more useful for it. Um, and we have been wearing masks more so since the pandemic. Um, however, the other bad news on the masks is that in these masks, um, they are they contain chemicals, and um, you know we're wearing them you know still for our shifts, and whether that's a surgical mask or an N95. But um, Greg um, and Logan and uh, others have been working really hard on cataloging, catalog uh, excuse me, cat cataloging all of the research that's available about these different um, chemicals and masks. Um, that contain arsenic and heavy metals and phthalates and PFAS and formaldehyde. Uh, I don't know if you've ever put a mask on, especially some of those ones with the foam uh, for the nose. You can smell a really heavy smell when you open up the bag. Um, and we've really seen that some of these have VOCs um, and other things in there that it's not healthy to wear. Um, now, it's really hard to prove um, causation for uh, health effects from uh, these medications, but we do know that you know nurses are wearing these these masks for long hours, um, and we've been working on submitting a health hazardous uh, assessment to NIOSH for further evaluation of these risks. Um, we do need additional research to understand these exposures. Um, biomonitoring research. This is something else I've been uh, uh, working on with um, uh, University of California, Berkeley, Dr. Ra Ra Rachel morello Frosch, um, and Dr. Ruthann Rudell from Silent Spring Institute. Um, and this study um, is called the Women Workers Biomonitoring Collaborative. And it is a study that is um, going to do a second round of recruitment really soon for um, UCSF nurses, uh, females um, working um, uh, full-time by doing a wristband, like a silicone wristband, um, a questionnaire, and then also doing biomonitoring where nurses can provide urine and blood samples um, to look for different um, chemicals present in, in their blood, urine, and then collect it on the wristband. And we're gonna be looking for different chemicals um, and medications, um, disinfectants, things like that, that will uh, potentially put those nurses at increased risk for um, breast cancer. Um, so the study is interdisciplinary and it's funded by the California Breast Cancer Research um, Program. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, it's a collaboration between um, UCSF and UC Berkeley and Silent Spring Breast Cancer Prevention Partners um, and uh, Commonweal and the Women Worker Biomonitoring Collaborative. There's also a lab at an NYU. So as I mentioned, running out of time, I wanna leave some time for questions as well, but we're gonna collect um, blood urine and, and silicone wristband um, use for the 60 nurses and 40 office workers and measure those chemicals and see if there's any difference between the, what nurses and office workers are um, exposed to and see if there's um, uh, the, the silicone wrist bones that are gonna be worn um, correlate with any of the um, uh, chemicals we find in the blood as well and identifying those changes in the metabolome associated with the Cancer. Didn't learn more about this. I'm happy to chat with you also um, uh, offline because I know we're only kind of limited to an hour today. Um, so that was just a brief, brief overview of some of the stuff that I've been working on and some of the things um, that uh, been interesting to me. But there's so much more to do with greening hospitals, and so I just put down a couple ideas for um, these future topics uh, for presentations from from this um, California Nurses for Environmental Health and Justice organization or for webinars as well. Um, operating rooms uh, has a great opportunity for greening. Um, we can talk about the sterilization of equipment, um, eliminating ethylene oxide and blue wrap and the waste that goes along with that. 
Anesthetic gases, there's a lot of carbon emissions from anesthetic gases, depending on which type of gas there are. Um, the exposure for those waste anesthetic gases, once patients are extubated and their um, your nurses are caring for them in the recovery room, what is the exposure to the, to the nurse that's uh, caring for those patients and the waste anesthetic gas that's in the air? Um, the OR smoke um, that's in the operating room from the cautery devices, um, just some ideas around that. There's also op opportunities for um, recycling um, uh, in the operating room in terms of all the sterile water containers and things like that. Um, we can also talk about energy conservation in the future, the built environment, designing um, hospitals to be um, less, uh, to be more energy efficient. Um, one of the interesting things I uh, learned recently is about uh, one of our radiologists uh, was did a, an analysis of how much energy is used uh, on MRI machines and like the MRI machine uses as much energy as like your whole house does for a whole year in one day or something like that. And so he was interested in uh, seeing if there's any MRI machines that can be turned off at night um, while they're not being used um, for saving of energy. Um, we can also talk about supplies, purchasing, packaging, um, the circular economy and take back um, reprocessing of a medical equipment or donating medical equipment as well. And some of these are not my um, uh, area of expertise, but we would love to continue our relationship with all of you and have you continue to join us for webinars and CEUs and work on some of these important um, uh, issues. Um, and I'm just going to leave a few minutes for questions, but I just wanted to share this picture of an iceberg. And I thought this was a really interesting um, analogy for nursing and um, Nurses Week and environmental health. But um, as a nurse, we have the, op uh, excuse me, let's see. Uh, remember, nurses are like icebergs. At any one time, you're only seeing what, uh, what they're actually, one part of what they're actually doing. And um, that's from uh, Ian Miller. So I thought that uh, that makes a lot of sense, but nurses are really poised to um, to work on these issues because you know how the hospitals work, you know what's going on with the patients, um, and our nurses are integral for um, making change. And uh, thank you all. So I think we at least about ten minutes for for questions. Fantastic. So I want to bring up um, one question that was in the chat. Uh, roughly about like half an hour ago. Um, it was when you were giving examples of things to do inside of the hospital, there was a question about what about the filmy plastic? I keep reading different articles that none of the thin filmy plastic that is recycled um, is recycled and it just ends up in the landfill. Uh, it was asked by Ellen. I'm, Ellen, I'm not sure if you want to expand a little bit more on that for I think I know what she's talking about, like the like um like a plastic bag or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I so know, uh, I used to work in veterinary medicine and I know it was like a big thing. And it was actually up in San Francisco. And uh I would like I would haul these like huge bags down to the grocery store and be like, I'm doing a good thing. And I just keep seeing more and more articles that are like, nope, they just get shipped to different landfills and burned or Shipped to other countries or whatever. So that's a really good point, and I think it. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, and it kind of even goes beyond um, beyond that. Um, I have a lot of feelings about recycling. I think it's um, important, but I think that sometimes we think we're doing we're doing a really good thing, or we're doing more when we're when we're recycling. And I'm not I'm not saying we shouldn't recycle, but I am saying that. Um, Recycling is not going to fix the problem that we have in terms of how much waste we have. Um, and I don't have any facts for it, but I can work on some of those for you. Recycling depends on the area that you live in big time. Um, you know, when I was in, I'm going to name, name the state, I was in Missouri recently and um, they're not even recycling aluminum cans there. And it's just like crushing because aluminum, aluminum cans can be recycled to a, another aluminum can. Um, easily. And it breaks my heart that that's not even going on there. It's just, they don't have the facilities or the infrastructure to do that. Um, when different places recycle different things, um, depending on the quality of the facility, they can, 
create different things or not. And for a while, I know that, and I don't know currently, but they were trying to collect those thin filmy plastics, like plastic bags and recycle those. But um, they don't, when they, when those film, filmy plastics end up like in the regular recycling, they jam up the machines and cause them to break because they get stuck. Like imagine like a, uh, in, in a conveyor belt type of thing, they get stuck in the conveyor belt and they just kind of jam it up. So that doesn't work. But if you bring them back, like in a bag themselves, I think sometimes they were trying to recycle those, but I, I don't think that there's a lot of, I don't know, recycling that goes back to a high quality uh, item. And I think a lot of times that they have to ship those items like hard plastics all the way back to China to recycle them and create them into, you know, park benches or playgrounds or things like that. And so um, I think there's some higher level things that we can focus on recycling that are going to have more of an impact like aluminum and glass and things like that. But it really depends on what area you're in. Um, and I think it's important for you to know that and I will say that I think composting is 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 a form of recycling that is really important for us all to do, um, and that might have a really big impact on um, your hospital system. I know that it's hard to implement that in a hospital system, um, but keeping um, food waste out of the landfill is very important to decrease the the byproducts that the the gases that those um, that food waste creates and you can actually turn it back into healthy soil. And, and so that's like something that's a, I think a bit more important than focusing on the, the filmy plastics, unfortunately, um, but good point. Uh, Greg, you have your um, mute. Yeah, I was gonna uh, also shout out that, um... Ellen also had a wonderful idea for um, needles that they don't use for long acting injectable kits and they donate it to wildlife rescue and rehab centers. So awesome. huge shout out there. <laughs> awesome. And before, um, uh, before I, I really would love to work with you all, even if you just want to give us updates on what you're doing in your hospital, I really want to encourage you to join our, uh, our work group. Um, it's great for your career advancement and I want to hear from you all what you're doing in your, in your unique areas. And so, um, Greg, if you don't mind, once you're done, ask me the next question to just make sure that link is in the chat again for yeah. people who want to come join us, um, to do, work on, um, uh, future issues. Just threw it in the chat now. Um, I did see a hands that was up, but now is down. I'm not sure if you want a chance to ask your question that I can go back to another question in the chat. Hi, this is Ronnie. I would really appreciate a, a moment or two. Um, I want to ask a question that kind of relates to the last comment regarding donations. Um, I really am trying to start a program where we're able to donate expired um, items to a local university that they can then use in their Sims lab. Um, their expired items are not gonna be used on a real person but there's a concern about legalities of it all. Have you come across any legalities of donating items? And, and can you give me any tips on working with the legal system to make sure it's all done correctly? Great, great question. Um, this is not something that I have um, done a lot of, but I would love to connect with you offline because I do know some professors that have joined us before who are interested in getting those um, sim lab kits to their students. Uh, she told me they make your, each student get, you know, pay $200 to get the practice um, equipment that could actually just be um, from unwanted medic, unwanted or expired um, equipment. I think um, and this is a, this is an area that like, I don't know, maybe we need to change the policy um, for, on this and yeah, it might be a little challenging, but let's, let's, let's explore it. So if you don't mind contacting me afterwards, maybe we can look into um, connecting um, you with those professors that are interested in providing that and then find out about um, the, the legal aspects of it and the hurdles that we have. Definitely. I will most likely uh, definitely do that. Thank you. Wonderful. I will also mention that Karen Urso had a, a very similar question in that regard. 
Uh, going to a, another question that I just sent you to the chat is, uh, is there research showing how much exposure to some of these carcinogens would cause the effects that you discussed? Okay, sorry, can you say that one more time? Is there research showing how much exposure to some of these carcinogens would cause the effects you discussed? No, it's really hard to um, it's really hard to to prove causation from an exposure from chemicals. Um, it's that's really challenging, and our focus of our research is is a little bit more broad in, in that respect. Um, I think that. There are certain things that have been very much more linked to cancer, such as like the pesticide Roundup and things like that. But it is um, really challenging to know, unless you're like working with a particular product all the time, same product, it's really hard to have a, a proof of causation. Um, and more research needs to be to be done to understand that. But I think we're interested, you know, in finding different groups or different um, cohorts of, of nurses who have cancer or exposures that, you know, it seems odd and that can help um, understand what those exposures or risks are. Let's see. Is there, we have enough time for one more question if anyone. That's the last one. I did uh, also note that Maria threw something in the chat and would love to uh, connect you with you. So I, I just uh, sent uh, her message to you, Lisa, and Great. then also her email. So that I'm also to willing to stay on and chat and just uh, you know have a conversation with anybody um, who wants to just stay on afterwards. Um, since there's, it just fills my heart so much that there's so many of you on this call that care so much to be here today. So. If you want to stick around for a little while, I don't know if we're allowed to do that. Stick around for a little bit, just have a conversation and connect people who've got, you know, um, uh, questions or resources together. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, just as a final point before we potentially uh, do that, though, I do want to do a little plug. So if you do like this content, um, and you want to see more of it, we do have all a lot of our webinars that we have done in the past is up for CEs on our website. Then also we are going to be doing hosting a conference in Bakersfield on June 7th and 8th. We're, we plan on doing a lot of uh, discussions about like environmental health, but also we plan on doing um, oil field tours and uh, agricultural field tours as well along that two day conference. So if you'd like more information about that, feel free to reach out to me or you can check out our website at californianurses.ehj.org. <clears throat> Absolutely. So what I can do is um, after this 